Cal's Table Processing with XSLT and Schematron. Please take it away. Hello, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm going to present some code which <coughs> is slightly embarrassing, and that's all mine. Um, my colleagues at Delta XML do help with some of our table processing code, and they contribute to our table handling. And recently, um, from the beginning of the year, John Lumley has helped us with some performance um, tracing analysis of some of our XSLT code, and he's made suggestions on how to do some of, our, some of the performance improvements I'm going to talk about here, including the use of an iterator. Um, so, a quick introduction on the slide. So, Cal's tables, old hat. Um, it might be more interesting to talk about some of the XSLT work we've, do, we've been doing, where we've been using some of the latest XSLT features. And so, that might interest some of you. And we're also talking about how we merge and meld, in a, in a way, um, XSLT and Schematron together. Um, so, let me move on. so I've made um, some screenshots of one of our test files to illustrate some of the things we do with Cal's tables. Um, we do in comparison. And so in the file on the right hand side, we see we've got a kind of um, cell merge happening. And that's a structural change. And we want to be able to handle those structural changes when we do our comparison. Um, we found out a number of years ago that if we try and use the edit path minimization approach, try to minimize the number of added and deleted things as an optimization function, uh, when we apply that to tables, it gives bad results. It tends to give you tables where you have um, different numbers of columns in different rows. And so we needed to consider the validity of the table as well as the alignment process. Um, a few of the different kinds of results you get uh, from that. So you can see on the left hand side at the bottom we have a table result which we've, um, uh, is effectively a combination or a comparison of the two uh, tables at the top. And we're using that a screenshot from Oxygen and we've used their CSS um, styling. And there's an option on the style menu to select color revision changes and it will do something like that. The right hand side is a accept reject result and one of the things we wanted to make sure happens here is that when you accept or reject a change um, the for, for, for each operation the result remains valid and so you can see two deletes there you you couldn't for example delete one of those rows so we've, we've looped things into a kind of a coarser grain of change in order to maintain the validity due to the structural change that's happened. So, I've tried to indicate some of the things, um, some of our requirements for the validity checking here. So imagine a comparator with two inputs and we want to be able to check whether the input files are valid. And if I can paraphrase the CAL specs, there's a requirement there that says if you read something and it contains errors, you should report them as warnings. So that's one reason we try and do that. Another reason is when we're trying to do our table alignment, we're using different um, heuristics or matching um, alignment approaches. And in some cases, we have three different alignment approaches. Um, what we want to do is we want to pick the best alignment result, but also own, um, make that choice out of the only the valid results. So we apply our validity checking for tables both on inputs and as part of our output processing to make sure that the results are going to be valid. So we try and follow a valid input, valid output approach um, to the formats such as Ditter and Docbook in general, but also to the tables as we approach, as we approach them. Um, we had some embarrassing uh, bug reports early on when um, we had um, errors in tables detected by these things <coughs> that have gone through a publishing process which include things, things like data open toolkit, topic XSL, and we'd actually given two valid inputs, we produced an invalid table which had failed at the end of the, the kind of publishing chain. So we wanted to be careful and kind of resolve these kind of issues that um, we didn't want to be guilty of any of them. 
So, um, what is CALS? It's a uh, Oasis specifications. It, well, it's a set of specifications, and um, they go back uh, a few years. They, in some cases, predate XML. So, some of them are coming from the SGML world. Um, we take the view that we kind of treat them as a set. So, we try and implement um, all of those <coughs> things. There's the last one is called the um, exchange table model. Some people call it the exchange subset. It has um, a kind of restricted set of operations of the first one. Different <coughs> XML document specifications will choose different ones. So, for example, if I remember this correctly, um, DocBook will be the first one, and I think Ditter is the last one of those specifications. Um, so though, those, are, those are the specifications. They haven't changed a lot. I don't know if there's in a lot of ongoing activity on the maintenance of them. But they are growing in ad adoption. So I've mentioned things like Ditter and Docbook, which are also Oasis specifications. You'll see CALS tables in things like S1000D and some, new, some newer documentation formats. ISO STS um, has started using them. So the, the, the wi they're in widespread use. So, um, let's start with an example. Um, so, here's a CALS table. It's, it's actually a T-group, and most, uh, most tables use this, um, start, really start at this T-group element. You can put um, titles and other kind of metadata around the T-group. Um, you declare the number of columns, and you can define these things called column specs. Some, in some cases, you can no give the column numbers. In other cases, you can name them. Um, you can create a wide, a, a spanning column by using <coughs> a span spec element. And then in the example I've drawn at the bottom, you can see that we have um, a wide header and a wide uh, row. Now, I was going to ask a question. Um, can anybody tell me what's wrong with that? With Diane here, can she cast a memory back to you? Any, any authors on? Uh, th this is invalid. Anyone? Any takers? Uh, no, I'll stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. No, the no, there's only, only one entry in the head of the and there should be two once you be empty. Is that right? No, no. The, the ent the, that entry is spanning two through the it's span spec. Right, yeah. It's spanning um, so both columns say. of the table. Yeah. Uh, so what? one spans two, but you've got two rows to span there. Sorry? Yes. No, that's fine. That's, that's, not, that's not a problem. The, pr the problem is that you can't use the span name attribute in the context of the T head. Yeah. The spec says you can't. I don't know why, but that's what it says. <laughs> okay, so that's a what I call the context constraint um, that we need to check in order to make sure that that result is valid. Um, it exhibits, this example shows you a few different styles of CALS tables you see. Um, in some uh, outputs, for example, FrameMaker, every entry tends to refer to a call spec. So that tries to adopt, uh, FrameMaker adopts a writing style where everything refers <coughs> back up to the top of the table. Um, other systems will, unless there's a need to use, use things like span specs or name start, name end, they will uh, just use entries by themselves and not refer up and you can infer their positions um, using a set of rules. So in order to correct that, we have to <coughs> make that change, and the T head will have a name start and name end, and that's a valid CALS table. Okay. So here's a slightly more complicated example of a structural issue in a CALS table. And um, what I've done here is um, illustrate a screenshot from uh, oxygen. So um, this is uh, using schematron, and it is drawing a red line on row 33 to indicate a problem with that entry. And what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that there is overlap, and that is a 
Um, one of the validation constraints we're concerned about. And I've tried to draw on, on the diagram <coughs> at the top a, a red box around uh, the entry that's on the second row and a green box around the entry on the third row of that table. And there's overlap, and that is not allowed. So um, that's how we um, present that validation result. I'll step back a little bit and mention something I should have mentioned earlier. Sorry, <coughs> going forwards. One of the things we thought about when we came here was, um, when we looked at our architecture, is how do we implement this? And if our only concern was to <coughs> check the validity of these things flowing, flowing through a, a kind of our pipeline architecture, we could have implemented that in XSLT, written a set of functions that returned a Boolean result to us, and that would have been sufficient. But we, as well as checking input validity and using it in our output processing, we also recognised a support issue, that our, um, our users of our software and their users further down the chain would want to know about the, the validity. And we decided to try and use Schematron to do that. And so by, release it, by making the Schematron open source and releasing it and making it easy for people to use in things like editors, so that will take us back to the oxygen screenshot, we can, we can, um, we can get these kind of changes identified earlier in the process. So before we do our comparison, we're hoping that the people creating um, tables and developers will, will see these kind of problems. And we had a recent success in the last couple of weeks. We had a customer who was using zero-based column numbering in their CALS table <coughs> detected the error. They were producing an in-browser JavaScript editor, um, producing Ditter, and we got them to change their zero-based to one-based numbering of their column numbering, and it fixed the problem. So you can use it in things like um, editors, and this is a screenshot of Oxygen. So for example, you can adjust your doc book, um, document type, change the validation scenario, add a bit of Schematron, and it will do that validation you just see. And it will apply that to all your doc book files. So here's, here's, here's some embarrassing code. Um, this was my, in order to do that overlap calculation, we need to calculate the distance between rows. And um, this was my first attempt. I, when I wrote this, I realized that it would probably be slow. I, uh, in my defense, I will say that I did consider at the time using the node set comparison operators, the double less than, double greater than operators in XPath to see if I could do it better. I tried for about 20 or 30 minutes um, and reverted back to my first attempt and so this was our, um, the code we used. And as you see, it takes two rows, it calculates, and it goes all the way back to the beginning of the table, counting preceding siblings, takes a difference, which is the absolute value. Um, as you might expect, uh, we had a few problems, and um, we had some customers saying, this is quite slow. So we tried to make an optimization. We did some um, profiling. We discovered that was our most used function in all of our CALS tables code, and we decided how do we optimize that. And so this is something we did in the days of about Saxon version 9.3. So we tried to use a map in, um, to optimize that function. Um, a map has to use atomics as their keys. We tried to figure, out, figure a way of doing that, and the way we came up with was to use generate ID to give us a kind of handle on each row. And then the map would do that preceding count once, and then we could use it, uh, use a map lookup when we calculate the row distance and try and optimize the function. And it did give good results. It solved a, a, a few problems. So um, that was the first optimization we did. And it was, it's been in the code for two or three years now. Um, but with John coming to join us and a few things, we knew we still had problems. And I'll show you where that code is used. So we have another function which calculates the, for a given row, 
which is the parameter. It calculates which of the columns, and that's <coughs> represented by column numbers in a set, are overlapped. And in my kind of naive XSLT brain, I thought the best way of doing that was to um, apply this on each row and then look upwards to the preceding rows. And given that more rows can go all the way from the top to the bottom of the table, you needed to go all the way back. Um, calculate that row distance and check whether any of the more rows values could impede, me, impede at that point. And that's at least n squared. Uh, and we knew we, we still had a problem there. So the recent solution to that is to use some XSLT free, XSLT free features. And we've used uh, an iterator to try and improve the performance. So rather than looking back all the time, um, which sort of fitted in with our um, <coughs> X, XSLT and writing assertions in schema, schema tool that you need. We thought we'd go forward, use an iterator. So we have an iterator um, that's using a parameter which is a sequence of integers corresponding to every column in the table. We initialize it to zero. Then for each row, we calculate uh, which of the columns have more rows entries in there. And so we create a map from column number to the more rows value for that column, which is called the row map. And then as we go through iterating forward through the table, um, we can say, let's subtract one from that, or use a new value until we get to zero. And so that is um, what that max um, uh, function is doing on the, on the last line for each of the column entries in that, in that list. And so that's kind of pictorial uh, diagram to, to illustrate that a little bit better. So the more those two in the middle, you start off at two, you decrement as you go down, iterating forward all the time. And it should be, it should be much more efficient. Um, I'm going to skip a few sections now. Um, the, I, I do describe these in the paper. Um, we put that iterator into a function, and we use that function in an accumulator. So we calculate that grid for each table in a document, and then we can refer to it. And this is coming, coming into the Schematron world. Schematron has let. I prefer to use XSL variable because of indicator types. So we declare the types, we look up our accumulators, and we can get, for example, a more rows um, variable at the bottom here, and we can use that in our assertions. But the structure of Schematron with its kind of pattern rule-based structure means that we, can only, we only need to calculate these variables once, and we can apply them in a number of different assertions in Schematron. That's a nice benefit there. Um, performance results. So... Um, we had two customers who gave us support cases about our table performance. And there's some details of the formats, the data, the sizes. Um, skipping to the bottom, one of them was taking over 11 hours um, to run. And we've got that down, now down to 2.2 seconds. I think we've gone, probably gone from cubic to quadratic to linear performance in that time. So the middle one is our kind of simple row distance optimization. It did give us a benefit when we did that two or three years ago. The latest iterator one gives us really good performance improvements. Um, a few comments about what, what we discovered in the process. Um, accumulators don't need to accumulate. You don't need to use dollar value. And we found that a a useful approach. Um, it's almost like a map from a node to some <coughs> data you want to calculate. And that's one way of, that's how I kind of um, began to view them. Um, another thing is that the function is our kind of common unit. I haven't talked too much about xspec, but xspec allows us to test functions. We can use the functions in the schematron. We can use them in XSLT. And we use these functions in more generally in our tables code. So we wanted to be able to test functions with XSpec and also invoke them from Schematron. I thought when I first saw Schematron, it was kind of more about XPath. But I, I'm beginning to come to the conclusion it's equally at home with a function. 
Um, so the current state of this is um, works with P and EE 9704 in Saxon. Um, we've worked usually from the command line. Um, the source code is there, and I um, committed the latest changes I'm talking about last night. Um, in the process of testing it in Excel as well, and hopefully can report on some results of that in the future. Um, doesn't quite run in Oxygen 18 yet. Um, that's because of some of the accumulated changes. I think Oxygen Storm is using um, Saxon 9.6 in its current release. Uh, when that moves forward, it should work in the Schematron validator in Oxygen. And our current products don't have it. We need to make some <coughs> API changes and code changes to support Saxon 9.7. <coughs> and then we'll be releasing these changes. Um, got a few more minutes. Okay, a few final notes on Schematron. So this is our kind of build compile process. And we start with um, some uh, Schematron. We use the SVRL generator that uses the skeleton. The result of that isn't quite suitable for what we need. And we have two further processes which we wrote to take the generated Schematron checker that comes out of that and modify it to change its control flow in various ways. Um, we get, at the end of that process, a table checker, and that has all the documents flow flowing through in our comparison and merge products. Um, so what are those two issues we have? One of them's phasing. Uh, we wrote the schematron assuming that you would do things like simple context constraints first, referencing constraints, and then the more complicated structural stuff later. And we, we heard the word phase, and we thought, OK, one phase will run, and if there's any failures, that will prevent the next phase running. Schematron doesn't quite work like that. Um, well, at least the skeleton implementation doesn't work like that. Um, you tend to have a choice between which phase do you want to run, and there's no easy way of stopping it. So we made some structural changes. We have some help from the folks on the Schematron mailing list to do that. The final uh, uh, problem we had with the Schematron result was the standard output is a, effectively a flat list of assertion reports. And we wanted to understand the validity of a table. So we changed the structure which applied a, a set of modes in sequence, starting at the root element for each of the um, phases previously. And we, rather than doing them from the root element down, we applied them on a table level. That allows us to put a, uh, an attribute on the top of the table to say whether it's valid or, or not. And we also, rather than have a, a single flat list, you can kind of reconstruct reconst some of the locations of them and do a complicated grouping process to work out which tables are valid. But we change the control flow and we put the individual assertions inside the tables at the beginning and then we go back through the call specs and through the uh, rest of the body. So that's another change to the control flow we made. And we'd be interested to hear if people have similar issues with Schematron and want to discuss these kind of approaches further. Um, that's it. Thank you, Nigel. We have time for some questions. You okay? Yeah, I have one question. Have you considered uh, using IXSL number? To do, have you considered using access on number two counting of nodes? Because I believe that Saxon is caching the values in many cases, so you could gain a linear performance as well, probably. I think I did. I'm trying, this is two or three years ago. Um, there may have been problems with nesting, uh, with tables inside each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did try it, but in the, in the end, I came back to that horrible. Um, preceding sibling yeah. account. Another thing you could look at is memo functions. Yeah. Because memo functions are effectively an implicit map. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I found, I was kind of waiting for iterators to come along because I found them a more natural fit in my head for, for, the, for the problem. Uh, I should learn more about memo functions. Yeah, you mentioned at some point about the accumulators, mm. um, that they don't have to accumulate. Of course, you can put any expression in it so you could return a constant. Yeah. 
Um, but there's also nothing in the accumulators that says that they don't need to be reevaluated. So a processor, in, in one of the slides you, you showed uh, a function call inside an accumulator, I believe. Uh, so yeah, yeah. each time you call the accumulator, it's possible that that uh, function call will be reevaluated, losing the edge that you have with uh, performance. So I mean, in that in that case, mm. using the accumulator does not add a performance benefit over calling the function. In which case, Michael Case suggested to use a memo function, which must be cached, uh, maybe a better and more um, cross-processor um, okay. uh, solution to better performance enhancement. Okay, I'll look at that. <coughs> Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Nigel. Okay.